one. And good morning. It is Sunday, September 10th, uh, 2023. We're moving into from 5783 to 5784. And we're in the month of Elul. And that is the month before um, Tishrei when we have Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And what do we do during the month of Elul besides prepare, get our orders into Shevitz? Uh, we uh, blow shofar in the morning, and I've asked Rabbi uh, to be here to blow shofar, and uh, so we can start off the morning in a little getting ready for high holidays. Rabbi. I, do you hear it? <laughs> we, right I, we didn't hear it i i don't know if you have to sh i don't know if you have to share if it's like a musical instrument you have to share your sound but we, we heard a little bit of it right. um yeah it was nice and loud in my study okay well that's good <laughs> um rabbi can you tell us what you're doing this afternoon so this afternoon i will be uh among the many places i'll be this afternoon one of them is at a protest at Fountain Square in Evanston. We'll be blowing shofar there as well. Actually, I'll be standing with uh, Israelis who are here in the United States in solidarity with the Israelis that are protesting in the streets in Israel, protesting for democracy in Israel. So we will be lending our support and there'll be uh, um, Jews across the spectrum of American Judaism out there together with the Israelis and um, letting the folks in Israel know that we are with them as they uh, uh, they fight to keep the rights of uh, the majority in Israel and um, and to preserve the Supreme Court in Israel. Okay. So I invite so anyone who wants to to join me at, in Fountain Square in Evanston at two p.m. this afternoon. Right. Um, and I will Google the address um, during the talk and put it in the chat uh, if people have any other uh, uh, questions about that. Rabbi, thanks so much. Um, sure. And we'll we'll see you all next week because it's Rosh Hashanah. <clears throat> so uh, without any further ado, uh, I am going to um, here is our speaker, Mark, and I am going to introduce him. Uh, so Mark. Um, Haynes is a grandchild of four Holocaust survivors, and he's going to be talking about how he's mobilizing Americans to make our government more representative, as well as how we can ensure American companies are neither complicit nor complacent in the war in Ukraine. He used to work in the White House on anti-genocide advocacy. And uh, Mark, you have a lot to tell us today, so please, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, is my screen okay, Sherry? Yes, yes, I can see it. Perfect. Um, great. Well, thank you, everyone, for um, uh, for joining and for having me. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. I thought, um, as Vanessa shared, um, I would love to talk to you about specific ways um, you can get involved um, in both or one of the efforts that I'm that I'm working on, and I'll go into more specifics. Um, but that's sort of the, the big thing. And basically before um, I go into both of those, I thought I would share, I'd share a little bit of my background. As Vanessa shared, I'm the grandson of four Holocaust survivors. My mother's parents uh, were from Austria and fled. My mother's mother was on the kinder transport and was able to flee to the United Kingdom. Um, when the Nazis uh, were bombing London, they moved further north to Scotland. Uh, so she was raised in Glasgow, Scotland, or grew up. Um, in Glasgow, Scotland, met another survivor, and they had three daughters. My mom, uh, who was born and raised in Glasgow, she has the great Scottish accent, um, so I can do any line from Braveheart, like, every man dies, but every man really lives, and, uh, and make it. And then um, on my father's side, he his father was from Prague and fled to Quito, the capital of Ecuador in South America, and he met another survivor. Uh, she was from Austria, and they got married and had one son. Um, my father, uh, born and raised in Quito, and my parents um, were both uh, visiting Los Angeles 
and uh, decided to get married and raise my sister and I uh, in Ecuador. Um, and so I belong, we belonged to a small Jewish community. There was one synagogue in the capital. Everyone was either a survivor or descendants of survivors. So every time we would go to shul for Shabbat or high holidays, uh, a lot of the elders who'd been in the camps had their sleeves rolled up with the numbers tattooed on their arms and uh, would always remind us uh, of the key lesson of never again, never. It was never, never allow an Ecuadorian or a Scottish person or American, never allow anyone to be targeted for who they are. Um, you should never be a bystander. You should always stand up. Um, and I was very fortunate after I turned 18 to come to the United States and got a scholarship to go to Swarthmore College, a very small school uh, right outside of Philadelphia. And in, um, in 2000, and my senior year, I think that was 2003 or four, um, there was an article by Nick Kristof from the New York Times uh, writing about what was happening in Darfur, Sudan. Um, and I was with some friends and the paper was there. And I guess one person was reading it or, uh, and was sharing just what they were reading about the atrocities happening. And it was called the first genocide of the 21st century. Um, both of then Bush administration, Congress, other governments were declaring the violence that was happening um, in Darfur, Sudan as a genocide. And so uh, like many of you, um, because I know lots of folks in Chicago and the Jewish community throughout the U.S., we were sort of confronted with this um, tale of two genocides of, um, you know, he, knowing that the Jews were in the camps, um, a lot of times in, in, in Darfur, uh, similarly, people were either in their villages or fleeing into eastern Chad. Um, people often treat uh, some of these crises as humanitarian crises. And um, it, while the Jews in the camps needed food, water, medicine, that was not the correct solution. Fortunately, America and allied countries went uh, and uh, freed the Jews uh, from the concentration camps. Um, but that was the question in Darfur. A lot of the response from the American community or others uh, were, was, um, you know, should we send food, water, and medicine? And, and we wanted to help them. And so as good students, uh, one of my favorite Mark Twain quotes is we did not allow our schooling to interfere with our education. So we skipped class uh, and went to the library to learn more about what was happening in Darfur, who was doing what. I couldn't beforehand point Sudan on a map. Um, so just trying to learn more about the conflict and, and what we could do. And we came across this amazing book that uh, if you have not read it, oops, um, there we go. If you have not read it, uh, highly, highly recommend you read it, won a Pulitzer Prize and a bunch of other awards uh, written by Samantha Power, who was then a professor at Harvard, uh, called A Problem from Hell. And basically it looked at all the genocides from Armenia, the Holocaust, Bosnia, Rwanda, Cambodia, and kept asking the question, what did the US know and what did it do? Or sadly, more likely, why did it not do more? Um, and her analysis again, was that we treat, we tend to treat genocide and mass atrocities as a humanitarian crisis, not a man-made crisis. So we respond to it as a humanitarian crisis, which again is with humanitarian aid, um, when we need to respond to it with, um, with intervention, uh, most of the time military, like we did with NATO and Bosnia, um, or, or lightly like what the US is doing now um, with Ukraine by sending support, we don't need to always send boots on the ground. Um, and we need to, the big thing that she showed was we need to mobilize and get political because most people don't organize politically when it comes to humanitarian crises, but with man-made crises, we do uh, engage our policymakers. Um, and so this was uh, very, very key lessons that we took to heart. And so we created uh, an organization called the Genocide Intervention Network, which was to empower individuals and communities with the tools to prevent and stop genocide. And um, there was a movement in the US in the nonprofit space, whether it's called social impact or on innovation or entrepreneurship, the goal was not just to educate people and hope they write checks and check the box and hope that that's it, was what could we do to look at systemic a systemic approach to this? Um, and there's a famous guy who says, you know, the, the classic quote of, it's better not to give a person a fish, uh, you teach the person to fish, but this sort of approach was you should revolutionize the fishing industry. 
um, sustainable netting, better uh, pricing and all that. So we try to come up with a, a more systems change approach to how to prevent and stop genocide. And one of the big things was to look at um, sort of separating all the different parts of our society. Uh, and we talk about the three sectors, but within each sector, there's obviously different parts and these different pieces require different um, ways to influence uh, them. They're not homogenous because a lot of times we'll just talk about the private sector is one thing or the government is just one thing, um, but they all require different tools and approaches to things. Uh, so I'll just give a few examples. Uh, one, because we were students in college, the tool that's used to hold students accountable is their report card. So we decided to create a report card to grade every member of Congress. Um, you know, the uh, NRA, other groups do this. It's not a novel concept, but no one had done this in response to genocide or uh, humanitarian crisis. So we created A through F, a report card grading every member of Congress, and we put it on this website called Dark War Scores, and it was unbelievable, the response. Um, members of Congress, not just their interns, not just their staffers, were calling us saying, what can I do to get a better grade? Um, I'm, I'm hearing from so many of my constituents. Um, others said, I just co-sponsored this bill or just voted on this bill. Can you please update my, my grade from a C minus to a B plus? So at least my constituents can know uh, that I'm making, uh, I'm doing a better, better response to this. So it's a very, very powerful tool. The other thing we did was to look at the role of the private sector uh, because it costs money and guns and bullets. It costs money to buy these weapons of violence. Um, they don't just come about by uh, free. And so we saw that many American companies were being complicit in providing the funding or complacent. Um, they were not ensuring that they were not part of the revenue stream that the government of Sudan was using. And so we studied the uh, uh, apartheid uh, campaign that a lot of Americans did, especially lots of college students did. Uh, to push college endowments to making sure that they, again, are not complicit or complacent. And so we we tried to refine that model because a lot of, uh, there are a lot of lessons learned. For example, a lot of black owned businesses were hurt when Americans were passing blanket sanctions um, to try to go against the apartheid regime in South Africa. And we did not want to hurt, you know, small owned businesses. Uh, we were really wanting to target specifically the government of Sudan. Um, and so we, we came up with a, a new model to try to do shareholder resolutions, engage companies, and divestment was the very last resort. So we try to harness the power of American uh, investors and companies to either improve their behavior or if there, if, the, if there was no way to do that, then divestment. So we got Harvard Corporation. We started with them. We got 60 colleges and universities to do it. And after students in California with all the U University of California system, they then wrote a bill to then engage former governor Arnold Schwarzenegger to make sure CalSTRS and CalPERS, the largest pension systems, um, were also not being complicit or complacent. So you can see George Schultz, George Clooney, Don Cheadle uh, in the background who came to help us um, successfully do this. And we got uh, similar bills passed in over two dozen states. So we had trillions of dollars uh, that were before being complicit or complacent to then being positive actors in this. Uh, and we shifted company behavior. Um, another tool that we did, uh, which doesn't exist sadly anymore, uh, we created a phone number called 1-800-GENOCIDE. And that's because most people don't know who their members of Congress are. Um, they don't, and if they do know who they are, they don't know their phone number or their name, they don't know their phone number. And if they do know all those things, they don't know exactly what to say. So we created a 1-800 number, just like we tried to make it as easy as ordering pizza or booking a plane ticket or whatever it says. You would call this phone number. We would ask you to enter your five digit zip code. And then we could identify who your specific representative or your two US senators uh, were. Um, and then we would connect you for free to those offices and beforehand give you the exact bill or resolution or whatever action uh, that it took to get them to take action. And again, we because of this phone number, we could track in real time. The data was the most powerful piece because we could go to any members of Congress. Uh, and we did. And we said like 2,343 people have called you, Senator Duckworth or Durbin. Um, why aren't you voting for this bill or co-sponsoring this bill? Um, and that like they they couldn't hide uh, that we didn't have those exact metrics. Uh, so we mobilized people in every congressional district and every state 
to call this phone number um, and, and were able to get many members of Congress to correctly, you know, vote or co-sponsor uh, for the bill. So happy to talk on that. I'm going to quickly uh, go through as Vanessa shared. I then uh, I did this for seven years, anti-genocide organizing, and then had the opportunity to go work in the White House on the National Security Council um, for then Vice President Biden. Hopefully that's loading. My um, boss was Tony Blinken, who is now the Secretary of State. Um, he, while he was my boss, left uh, uh, in the Obama administration to become Deputy Secretary of State. And then Jake Sullivan, who is now the National Security Advisor, uh, was also my boss and was just an incredible, incredible experience sort of seeing how the sausage is made on the inside. Um, because lots of times, as all as I shared for seven years, I was trying to push as many of the different levers from the outside. So it was very, very informative to see and understand um, what are the paths of least resistance to try to get change. Um, and, uh, and it's been very, very helpful. So when Trump won, I was then uh, out of a job and trying to figure out what could I do uh, to make a difference. And so I created two organizations. Um, progressive Shopper is to try to empower conscious consumers. Based on my experience uh, with Darfur and Sudan, um, lots of people, especially young people, uh, don't have a lot of money. And so, but we spend money every day buying food or getting on Amazon or whatever else it is. Uh, we vote with our dollars every day. And a lot of people want to make sure that their money is aligned with their values, whether you support climate change or LGBTQ rights or human rights. Um, there's lots of different issues people care about. But a lot of times that data is not either available or it's sitting on a PDF in whatever organization that tracks this. And that is not very empowering. So we created a browser extension, which is like a little app for your browser on Chrome or Firefox. We're building it out for Safari. Those are the major browsers that people use to look for their phones. And we put this little flag uh, red, purple, or blue. We started by scraping the Federal Election Commission because all that data is publicly available, um, but it's in not very empowering PDFs. And so we um, bring all that data on both corporate giving, and then we started reaching out to other nonprofits like Human Rights Campaign, tracks how companies treat LGBTQ employees. Do they have gender neutral bathrooms? Do they recruit, promote, uh, LGBTQ people on their boards or the C-suite. So we're bringing all that data. We have about eight topics and I can go into with Q&A uh, where we get all of our data, but it's on our website, uh, how, where we get our data. We try never to touch the data ourselves because we cannot be subject matter experts on all these issues. So we really try to find the trusted um, providers and bring their data into this uh, helpful little app. So once you download this little browser extension, whenever you go on a .com, which most of us, whenever we're on our browsers, many, most of us, I would suspect, most days are on a .com than we ever are on a .org. Um, and so we bring that information to you. You see that little flag. And if you want, you can click on it and we show you why that company is red, purple, or blue. And we're switching it to green, yellow, or green, uh, red, yellow, or green, more familiar uh, color scheme. And um, you can see both the political giving, but other issues. We then try to show you alternative companies. So whether United, and sometimes we don't always have choices. I know United in Chicago is very popular, um, but sometimes Southwest, or maybe it's Adidas versus Nike. You know, we try to give our movie theaters, AMC versus Regal. Um, we do have Cinemark. We do have options, uh, sometimes more easily than others. And then we try to show you those alternatives. And then third, we show you other ways to take action because... Shopping is never going to be the only way to address your social issues. So we try to provide you easy links to go back to that .org, um, you know, climate change or reproductive rights or whatever it is. We try to make it super easy for you to go back to that, that .org. Uh, so that's Progressive Shopper. We have close to 20,000 users. We're doing a very um, specific campaign right now on Ukraine, and I'm happy to go into more specifics. But there's lots of companies have left Russia. Uh, which was great. So we've probably never seen that number of companies leave Russia since the apartheid, uh, the, the campaign against the apartheid regime in South Africa. But there's still loads of companies that have continued to stay in Russia, and they are being, again, complicit or complacent by providing tax revenue. And Chicago-based Mondelez, 
which owns many, many of the candies and crackers and chocolates uh, that we may consume. Oreos is probably one of the biggest, but they own Cadbury and Milka. They have refused to leave. So we are really looking for more Chicago uh, land activists to help organize. We will send you flyers or banners um, to try to mobilize people to try to make sure Mondelez is not being complicit or complacent. We're doing another big campaign with Unilever, uh, which is in the UK, but they have a headquarters in New Jersey. So we're mobilizing folks in the New Jersey area as well. Um, so I'll, I'll put a pin on that. Happy to come back to it later. And then Inclusive America, this is where we're bringing data to look at diversity and inclusion. So when I was working in the Obama administration, many, many meetings were filled with the same type of demographic profile, which were white men from Ivy League law schools, or in shorthand, we call it male pale from Yale. And uh, that is not all what America looks like. And so we started by uh, taking the data uh, of people who serve in government. So the government is the largest employer in the United States, over 2 million employees. Whoever's president can appoint about 4,000 of those 2 million. Um, about a third of those 4,000 require Senate confirmation. So every cabinet member, every ambassador, multiple levels below. Um, and no one seemed to be tracking the demographic information uh, for these positions. And the federal government, as you may know, as any employer, private sector, nonprofit, cannot discriminate on seven categories, age, gender, race, or ethnicity, sexual orientation, disability, faith, and veteran status. So we are trying to do our best to tag uh, these people um, historically for the last 20 years and in real time uh, uh, based on these seven categories. Obviously, we do not know every category because the people may not want to disclose their disability or the sexual orientation, that's okay. This is just voluntarily disclosed data. So we, we do not have 100% um, uh, clarity on this data, but we're trying to do the best we can. And for example, there has never been anyone who's been a woman or identifies as a woman to ever serve as US ambassador to China or to Turkey or to Israel. Biden just named the most recent uh, ambassador, former treasury secretary, Jack Lew to Israel. I guess in Israel's history, because it's younger than America, there's never been a woman. We all know that there are women who are qualified to be U.S. ambassador to Israel. They speak Hebrew. They have lived in Israel. They have a graduate degree that may touch Israel or Middle East politics. So the pipeline excuse, which is a very common excuse, is oftentimes a BS excuse because, as we get, know for Israel, that's ridiculous that there's never been one woman to ever represent the U.S. to Israel. Um, so we're doing this for the 4,000 and we're trying to go uh, broader. And then we're also looking at the state level because like Governor Pritzker and many other governors can appoint people to boards and commissions. And many, many times these are just white men. Um, and we want to make sure that you got to be intentional about this. It doesn't just happen. Um, so we, we need to make sure that uh, people look at um, all the other categories uh, than just white men from Ivy League Law School. So we are working to not just diagnose the problem, but we want to build a database of qualified people uh, so that they can have a more diverse pool of candidates to consider. And then we're looking at policies um, and procedures to making sure government is more inclusive. So we look at three categories. We're, we're drafting bills. We had a bill uh, sign in December, so I guess now nine months ago, um, to make sure that these 4,000 positions, for example, they would the names would come out every four years. And now they're going to come out every year so we can do a better job of transparency uh, to monitoring who, who are being held in these positions. Um, we're drafting executive orders. Um, a particular interest for you, for example, might be on religious inclusion. So the Biden administration has done a phenomenal job, um, as you can see with this data, uh, at being more diverse and inclusive. But um, they ask, again, voluntary disclosure on people's uh, sexual orientation and gender disability. But government doesn't ask people for their faith identity. And so we talk to religious minorities, uh, in, especially like Muslim Americans or Sikh Americans or Buddhist Hindus, others, uh, including Jewish Americans. And I'll share the link. Um, and we think it's hard to be diverse if you don't have data. Um, and so we are recommending that the administration adopt an executive order to solicit voluntary disclosure uh, as well as make sure that, you know, for holidays, uh, people, 
and this is not the case for government largely, uh, to allow people to take holidays off, but also have trainings. Um, we have a Jewish liaison, there's a Muslim liaison, uh, but there may not be others in other, in other categories. Um, so this is another area we're trying to do. One small thing is the CIA, for example, does not, um, if you use a wheelchair, you cannot easily take a lie detector test. And without that, it's hard to get a job in the intelligence community. So we teamed up with a woman who became blind to try to make sure that the intelligence community, including the CIA, but not exclusive, um, provides reasonable accommodations, just like any other employer. Many other places do not have wheelchair accessible buildings. And so that's ridiculous if the government is asking every other employer to be accessible, that, that we should do the same. Um, so uh, uh, as I close, uh, I often uh, love uh, either alliteration or words that rhyme. And so educate, advocate, donate. Um, whatever the issues are, it could be diversity, equity, inclusion, it could be empowered uh, consumers, it could be anti-genocide. Uh, we just say you need to get smart on these issues, advocate. Um, you know, Duckworth and Durbin tend to be great um, on these issues. One of the things just to highlight that I was really proud that Duckworth, she told this administration, because um, we weren't seeing many Asian Americans being appointed, that she said she will not confirm more um, appointees unless they make sure that they're more intentional about Asian Americans. And the White House um, created an Asian American point person that reports to the chief of staff, then Ron Klain, now uh, Zients. And so when, when a senator uh, speaks, we often see immediate results in the administration. Um, so we would really love to work with you because Durbin and Duckworth are very senior in their positions. There's a specific um, bill we're looking to try to get passed on religious inclusion. So we would love to work with you guys if you wanna uh, engage senators Duckworth and Durbin to co-sponsor this. Um, and then donate, obviously give to uh, synagogues um, other organizations, uh, we will happily take money because uh, it takes money to um, to create change. Um, so I will stop there. I'll put my email. Um, they all go to the same place. But if you're particularly interested in one, uh, you can pick and choose which email to send. And um, I'll stop there. Um, before you stop sharing your um, screen, can you give us a live demonstration of how Progressive Shopper works? Sure. Um, like for instance, um, Home Depot. I'll just use Amazon just because um, you're so big and do everything. Um, hold on one second. Let's. I hope it works when I'm on the spot. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Still, that's okay. It's still loading. Um, so once it finishes loading, there should be a little, hold on because it's still showing that it's loading on my screen on the top. Right. Okay. Do you see on the top right, You some of you with Zoom, it may cover the top right of your browser screen. So if you move my face and all your faces a little to the left, where it has a little shopping cart, you should see a little yellow. Yes. Uh, kind of okay. So I will, so that that's like the really quick way. We're changing it from what I showed you, the blue, purple, um, red. We're now changing it to red, yellow, green. Um, so when you click on it, It'll open this window. Um, mm -hmm. Does that can you see that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we show how much money overall the company gives, and then we break it down because the company has its own pack. But employees that um, give individually and buy law in the U.S. If you give two hundred dollars or more, you must disclose who your employer is. And so sometimes the ge the generic thing sort of um, sometimes the employees don't always give how their company gives. And here you can see the company plays it more down the line and the employees are much more um, supportive of the Democratic Party or Democratic candidates. So yeah. that's uh, an example. And then when I click on serious issues, you can see, and again, I can show you where we get this data because that's often a question, but we could see Amazon does these additional things beyond their wow. political giving. The political right. giving is really helpful because it's apples to apples. You're giving a dollar here, a dollar there, or not giving money. And yeah. I'll show you some of the things that are, may not be apples to apples. So that's um, that's these additional issues. The second thing, we have a little menu bar. And all of you can download this. If you go to progressshopper.com, we have a little thing where you can download for free. You, you download all of this at progressiveshopper.com. Yeah, you download. It's just like an app on your phone. It's called an app for your browser. And it's called a browser extension or a plugin or an add-on. There's these different terms that is 
means the same thing um, like we call it for an app for our phone. Okay, so at the bottom of the little window that opened, that's the, that's the little house. I'll show you the little bar graphs. We then show, it's hard because Amazon sells so many things, but if you're on an airline, we'll show you airlines, hotel, only hotels. But here you can scroll up and down and you can see the competitors to Amazon, which we deem more green versus yellow versus red. And then uh, the little loud bullhorn, we show you like other ways to take action. Because again, shopping is not going to uh, solve the issue. So on any of these, you can click and you'll automatically go to um, those organizations that we've profiled at this moment. Wow. Just wow. And who does all the, who does all the work for that? You mean on the data or the technology? On the data, the technology, ugh, <laughs> we'll keep up with, but. Okay, so I'll show you, um, hopefully it'll load also quickly. So does this, can you see my screen okay? Yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so when I go how it works, if you scroll down, this is where we get our data. Uh -huh. And sometimes the data is already done and it's really easy for us to just import it. Sometimes we reach out to these organizations and say, hey, we've got close to 20,000 users. We really think that um, they would be interested. Could you do the data and ideally do it in this helpful, like the yellow, green, the, ye the green, yellow, red? And they say, sure, we'd be happy to do it. And sometimes they partner with other groups, like with paid leave policies. We brought these two organizations together and they worked in with us to develop that. Um, in some cases, they may... Um, have some of the information. So like this organization, Guns Down America, they just focus on banks and which ones finance gun manufacturers or the NRA. And so obviously there's more than just banks that people shop in. So they are in the process of uh, um, expanding uh, that beyond banks. So it, it's not a hundred, it's, sometimes it's uh, not a black and white or perfect. Sometimes we really have to work and uh, engage organizations to help get more data. Okay. I'll show you quickly. Um, one of the things we've been doing more, as I mentioned, Ukraine. Yes, I great, wanted to get into that as well. There's this great organization. It's a, it's a school, the Kiev School of Economics, and that's KSE. And they run this great website called Leave Russia or leave-russia.org. So you can see, and they do a phenomenal, phenomenal job of updating um, the data. So that the data was like perfect and it's getting better and better. So that has not been the, the area that we have felt needs the most help. So we have focused, because they're all, uh, all based in Ukraine, they're economics professors and their students. So we have built a page, um, which we would love your help. There's a lot of Ukrainian diaspora in the Chicago land area. Um, and so the Biden, so there's a tool that the Biden administration has strangely not used. It's called a business advisory. It's like a travel advisory when you think from the oh, state, yeah. like don't go there, or if you do go there, be aware of X, Y, Z. And so they have issued a business advisory to seven, uh, it started with the Trump administration, and then the Biden administration has issued this seven times. And so it doesn't, there's sanctions, which are obviously punitive, and it's mostly fo focused on the uh, arms industry or the oil industry, but there's a lot of consumer goods like uh, like Mondelez, Unilever, Procter & Gamble that I've shared. And so there's a lot of companies that are not on the sanctions list that continue to operate in Russia and are providing millions of dollars. The U.S. market, the U.S. companies are the largest companies once we, we work with the Kiev School of Economics more than any other Western, so Western Europe and U.S., Canada. U.S. companies are providing currently still the most tax revenue to Putin's government, to the war machine. And so we think if they're willing to issue a business advisory for all these other conflict areas, they should do so for Russia. And so we are urging the Biden administration to issue this business advisory. And a lot of it could just be copy and paste and edit what they've done for these other seven areas. And so we've worked um, with several House members to introduce a bill, HRES 274. You can click and you can read more. And we're working to get the Senate to introduce a companion bill. Uh, Senator Durbin wrote a letter with a few others, but a letter is nice. It gets out the door faster than bills. As you know, our Congress is not the most e efficient uh, entity in our society. So sometimes getting a letter out the door is faster than getting a bill, but we really need them to introduce a bill 
to put pressure on the administration. So we're we would love to get uh, Senators Durbin and Duckworth to introduce a, a companion bill. They can just copy and paste the House bill um, to do that. And so we, we're building a coalition of organizations to support this. And we're also identifying who within the executive branch historically uh, and currently play a role in issuing these business advisories. So a lot of times we're trying to demystify, if you say the State Department, who, who exactly in the State Department, um, or you know who in the um, National Security Council plays a role. So we're really trying to put pressure on them as individuals to get this business advisory. And so that's what our specific Ukraine campaign is doing and would love, love, love as many of you guys help um, with either the company specific and uh, or ideally both with the with the advocacy with the government stuff. Um, most of us, our representative is Brad um, Schneider. Do you have any idea how he comes down on any That's, of this? It's a great question. So let's just put the link and take a look. Yeah. I don't think so. You can see here in co-sponsors. Let's click. Right. I don't think he is one of the co-sponsors, but uh, stuff changes in real time. Um, so no, I do not see. Okay. Sponsor. So it would be really helpful if you guys said, please co-sponsor HRS 274. Okay. And again, like this bill does not require tax dollars. It does not require like any uh, punitive pressure. It's just giving guidance and it removes the veil of ignorance, which a lot of companies from the Holocaust to the present day were like, we didn't know, no one told us. This yeah. bill says you can never use that excuse. The government is telling explicitly the private sector, these are the these are the parameters. This is what we're asking for. If you're not providing, and it's nuanced, like if you're providing baby formula or insulin, like Russian babies and they're innocent, they're like they're not, they're not involved, they're not responsible. So keep providing those essential life-saving things. But Oreo cookies and Cadbury chocolate, I love those things, but those are not critical to life uh, sustaining efforts. So they should eliminate and make sure they're not providing revenue uh, to Putin um, when they sell those products in Russia. Um, and this business advisory, um, I see some of them were from 2021. How long does it last? Like um, so they can always update and change it. But for as an example, there's been three issued this year. So just a few weeks ago, yeah. like less than a month ago, they issued one because the situation sadly is deteriorating in South Sudan. Um, and so like, this is real time stuff. It's just weird that they uh, have yet to do so for Russia. Hmm. Um, and what do you think, you know, obviously this is all politics, so on and so forth, but what do you think is really tying their hands or why haven't they done it when they've done these other seven? Great question. So having worked in government and spent a lot of time advocating, it is crazy the power of inertia. Mm -hmm. um, they're putting out fires in so many other places. And so we've literally heard, and you can look it up, and I'm happy to say links, the State Department spokespeople have said, we've not heard from people asking for business advisory. So that's why we are working so hard to get the House, the Senate, and civil society to say we want a business advisory. Um, so I think we have not heard when we engage folks, there is no, I don't, there's no malice. They're not like, obviously they're they're not pro uh, Putin, government of, 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 of Russia. Um, they're pro uh, the people of Ukraine. So ideologically, there's no malice. I really think it's inertia. They're working so many on so many other things, getting humanitarian aid, defense spending. Secretary Blinken was just there um, you know, said that we're going to give another tranche of humanitarian aid and defense spending. So I think they're a bit overwhelmed. Another thing is that we, and we've had some other conversations with folks, this is not mutually exclusive to sanctions. Like those have more teeth and we want those. We want to make sure that the guns, the bullets, the bombs, the tanks are not like North Korea, uh, for example, is uh, supposedly meeting recent uh, in, in the near future with um, Putin uh, to deliver more uh, military hardware to them. Um, so we want sanctions. Don't get me wrong. Those are important. But historically, 
consumer goods are rarely sanctioned. And that's why we think um, the, the business advisory is a really helpful tool. So I think some folks are like, why aren't you calling for sanctions or strengthening them? We do want those things. But we also know that these um, industries don't get sanctioned and they're providing millions of tax dollars to the government of Russia. So I think part of that, in some cases, they feel a little overwhelmed because they're trying to get those sanctions and make sure their people are not finding loopholes to them. Um, and we say, having worked in government, it can very much walk and chew gum at the same time. There's more than just one person who works under Biden. Um, there's millions. And so we really think that they could knock this out in quick, pretty short order. So we yeah. think inertia, inertia is the biggest reason. Do you think there's somebody, well, there's got to be uh, organizations that are trying to keep Russia off this list? I mean, obviously, there are companies um, that would prefer not have like travel advisories. Like, if you're like, uh, let's say Maui, like, <laughs> like yeah. if you've got your book, your your tickets booked, you would rather not have to change your tickets. Like, that's life. Yeah. Um, and so, yes, there are companies that would prefer not having the U.S. government tell what to do. Plus, their consumers, plus their investors, because we're trying to get investors to say. You know, if there's a business advisory, you should not be able to um, um, operate there. Like, that's not OK. So, yes, there are companies saying we are going to continue operating. But like Uniqlo, they provide a lot of like consumer goods. Some of you may know that company. Like they yeah. got a lot of pressure and they said, oh, crap. OK, we will now leave. Like initially, like last year, loads of companies were leaving, but it wasn't like an one day all of them left at the same time. There was definitely the early adopters and then the laggards. Yeah. Um, or whatever's in between. So we definitely see that. And so we suspect those that don't want to leave uh, would prefer that this doesn't happen. But we've really, and we talked to congressional offices, like no one said, oh, the other side had lobbied us to do this. We just think no one is asking for this, which is why we need more Chicagoland folks to say, Durbin, Duckworth, please get this bill yeah. um, to do this because- they can't use that excuse anymore. I um, see there's yeah. a question. Yeah, Corey, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. This is this is really fascinating and, and, and really interesting work. So very impressive. My question is really going back to Mondelez. My understanding is just knowing, you know, employees at Mondelez and what have you, just being local. Um, my understanding is they are shutting down some ties and some operations in Russia and, and they have a plan in place by the end of the year. And so my question really is around I, again, I'm I'm certainly not as knowledgeable as you as, as you are on any of this stuff. But if I would have been a betting man at the beginning when when Russia first invaded Ukraine, I would have thought this would have been long done and long long over by now. And I think a lot of people shared that same opinion. Um, the fact that it went on like this. So how I guess my question goes back to then: How can a corporation, knowing what they do, and especially to your point about Oreos, they're not they're not supplying guns. They're they're supplying cookies, and and there's people in Russia like everyday you know people that are that are probably against the war as well that work there and and feeding their families with their paychecks just like we all do here. How what what's your what's your take on corporations being able to predict the future and say you know what we're going to change our complete business operations and potentially billions of dollars that we have obligations to shareholders et cetera to say you know we are going to shut down. And if we and if we are going to shut down, what happens then? Fast forward, they pull everything out of Russia, and let's say all of a sudden, you know, the the war in in Ukraine ends, and they want to start back up again. And let's say everything's hunky dory, and and that just takes millions and millions and millions of dollars. And you can imagine the corporate bureaucracy, and and to make those decisions is really tough. And so my yeah. question then goes back to like, how what what is really the expectations on a corporation? Like, because it's really hard just to shut operations down and. Sure. Sure. Off. It's a great, great question, uh, Corey. I'm going to put a link. Um, we're a member of this coalition called Beef for Ukraine. And so I just put the link so you can see, like, we reach out to all the companies saying, this is the information we understand. You may have more up to date or different information. We would really like to talk to you and figure out what could be a reasonable way to ensure you're not being complicit or complacent. And so you can see the letters to Mondelez and their responses or the lack of responses. So I just want to highlight that. So I have never run a Fortune 1,550. So uh, given, given that, I know 
that companies spend a lot of money when they try to expand their operations. So for example, when I grew up in Ecuador, McDonald's came and Burger King came when I was growing up there. And I don't think they made that decision lightly. I think they spent a lot of time surveying, which like, what do you think people would like? Um, how should we make sure we market it? Which location is best for getting product uh, market fit for people to walk in? And I think companies should, um, similarly when they like expand their operations, they should also have a similar thoughtful process of what happens if the place that we're operating in has um, political instability, financial instability, just like if they're not selling much, like I doubt McDonald's if like no one's walking through the door, they're like, we're going to just keep the doors open. Like these companies are pretty sophisticated and they adjust in real time or quarter, they do the quarterly reports, the SEC, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to treat them as dummies because they do smart, thoughtful, intentional things to start, to expand, to maintain, and to shut down. So if they're making no money, regardless of a war or uh, the company being led by war criminals, I think they would do that. So we're just saying like, take into consideration, not just the financial part, they have to do this with legal. We saw lots of companies change their operations with let's say, more regressive reproductive rights operations to support women. They were allowed to get personal time off to go to another state if they need to, to get some financial assistance if they need to fly to another state. So like these companies adapt financially, legally, and we're saying politically. Again, in Ecuador, my senior year, we had three presidents in one year. It wasn't genocide, but companies adapted to like, is there enough stability to stay? And to your point, it's not a black or white. It's not close down the entire factory we're leaving tomorrow. Sometimes it's like, look, we're going to keep it open. We're going to keep the keys, but we're going to like reduce it to a skeleton operation. We see this with our embassies. Like in Niger, there's a coup. Sometimes we say, okay, if you've got your children and family in the country, we're going to ask you to get them to fly out. You as the State, uh, State Department employee may stay there, or if you're not essential, you may have to leave. And we're going to keep our Marines and whatever the ambassador, whatever is still operating. So these companies are not going from zero to nothing. And I think that's where we say, let's talk this through. What could you do to make sure you're not part of the problem versus part of the solution? That's one. I would argue if we look back as Jews, which I assume all of us are on the Zoom, like if IBM or other companies during the Holocaust were like, shucks, like this guy Adolf is not like on our side, but we want to still like, we've got to make some revenue. We've got our employees operating. We got to do some other stuff. I think for a lot of us, it's like, there's a certain threshold where we're like, you are normalizing their behavior and that's not okay. And so if something genocide is pretty high up there, the president and his minister of children in Russia have like, now the international criminal court has indicted both of them for forcibly transferring children. Like there's certain crimes that are pretty high up there. It's not like he did a whoopsie and said something politically incorrect. Like, do we want, if we look back and said the same excuses companies are using now to operate in Russia, if those companies use those same excuses during the Holocaust with the Nazi regime, would we say fair game, still keep your doors open? Or would we say there's a there's a certain red line if you cry, if the situation is past that, you got to leave. And I think those are the two schools of thought you can pick and choose. Oh, that's interesting. Um and I guess one other question, and and it's it's just really interesting about Mondelez, and because I know they have huge operations in Ukraine as well, which is just it's a fascinating topic. I guess my my last question then is: Are there any other are there any other Chicago companies to call out, good or bad, that you'd recognize that that we may know and and maybe even be employed of, you know, people of our our synagogue? Um, great question, and I do not have the answer, and I'll work to get that answer because. Um, we, when we, if you go to like Leave Russia, which we link to, they they track because companies again, it's not static. So um, we've also tried because we have limited resources to try to focus on the biggest we think offenders, both by their like tax, their revenue given to the to the Russian regime. And I agree with you, like the, the Ukraine thing. We like it, like some companies, and this goes to my experience with Darfur. Sometimes the companies say we're leaving Russia and we're going to like double down and supporting Ukraine. Um, or we're going to make sure any revenue, even for the vital stuff, we're not going to keep a profit. Like we're going to maintain it and anything above that will go to supporting humanitarian aid or rebuilding. Like, again, like we can have a nuanced conversation with these companies. Um, so my short answer is I can't think of another Chicagoland company 
other than Mondelez, I will just say we're like particularly focused right now on Mondelez, Unilever, Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola, and PepsiCo. Got it. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I think that the um, you drew, you know, the example with the Holocaust, I think, is really something that um, for those of us students of the Holocaust can really um, can it resonates with. Um, I see Stuart Joanne and I'm unmuting you. Go ahead. Ask your question. Can, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Good, good, good. Well, I want to especially uh, compliment you on your work um, on, with uh, Darfur. Thank you. Um, because uh, my wife and I have a daughter, she and her husband were working for work for relief organizations around the world and were working in Darfur um, during all the difficulty with the Janjaweed going around the country, murdering people. Yes. Um, and um, finally, the situation got so bad where their organization uh, was trying to um, help them leave the country. So they were in a, a car with all their belongings driving um, across the country and, um, to try and get to the capital to get an airplane or a boat out. And they were stopped by Janjaweed, you know, driving around with their truck and their machine gun uh, mounted on the back. And uh, there were two Janjaweed on, you know, with, with the truck, he jumped off, you know, stopped their car, and opened the door uh, to the car and um, beat them up, pistol whipped them, and, and stole all of their belongings. And one of the Janjaweeds said to the other, Shall we kill them? And, you know, fortunately for them, the other one said, oh, no. let's just rob them, you know, and beat them, beat them up. Um, so, you know, we feel very fortunate that she and her husband survived. Yeah. Uh, and we did, you know, have some contact with George Clooney and others that were trying to help with the with the situation. And I know that the um, leader, ruler of the country, Al Ashbari, something like that was his name, got removed. Bashir. Bashir, okay. And the uh, military uh, took over the country. And I'm wondering if you can maybe update us on mm -hmm. You know what the situation is now. What it was from the time our daughter and her husband left um, fairly quickly, because I know there are other people with other questions as well. Sure. Well, first, thank you for sharing that story, and I'm so glad that they made it out uh, safely. If it sounds like a horrible uh, experience, um, unfortunately, the situation is not good. Um, uh, in some cases worse, um, mostly because American attention is far less on Darfur. Like uh, the American people, actors, journalists, um, government took a lot of notice on Sudan. And I'm very proud because I think the Jewish community really helped lead that effort. Uh, there's a huge, um, I remember uh, New York Times, I think, whole, uh, front, uh, full page uh, calling, I think it was the Bush administration at the time, AJWS, and lo lots of different Jewish groups uh, were leading the charge, um, not because the perpetrators 
or the bystanders or the victims were Jewish. You know, this is like a great uh, um, realization of the lesson of never again. So it made me really proud to be part of that movement. And it's not at that stage. The American people are not aware and not mobilizing on Sudan at nearly uh, anywhere close to that level. And the situation's worse. So um, there's a huge... Um, battle going on between two different warring parties in Sudan. Um, and some of the same people that were called John Jaweed are now in this rapid uh, uh, reaction force. There's so sometimes the names change, but it's the same people. And um, if you just Google or read up the news, um, they're committing a lot of atrocities in, in Darfur and sadly in other parts of Sudan. So I would say the situation is either worse or as bad, uh, but I would say worse than it was in the early 2000s when most of us were aware and organizing around this. Well, and I know they also, uh, you know, perpetrated uh, terrible um, atrocities on women. Yes, rape, rape was a weapon of war, is. And we're like, we see this also in Ukraine and sadly in many conflict areas, targeting girls and women um, is a common occurrence. Thank you. Hmm. Um, all of this brings, you know, back to mind all that we can be doing. Are there any other questions? Uh, you've given us a lot to think about today, Mark. Um, and... Um, I'm going right to progressive shopper <laughs> and uh, it's, I think it's incumbent upon us. Uh, we come on Sunday morning and we listen and now we need to get out and do something. And uh, hopefully um, everybody listening here can tell two more people and, and uh, we'll, we'll get something done. Um, I want to tell everybody who's listening that our next adult enrichment um, will be October 1st. Next week is Rosh Hashanah, then it's Erev uh, Yom Kippur, and we will be having um, Joseph Sassoon, who uh, wrote The Great Global Merchants in the Making of an Empire. So I think it's going to be very interesting. His book is out. You can go get it um, and, um, you know, see what see what he has to say. Um, you're getting a lot of kudos in the uh, chat. So, Mark, thank you so much. Uh, I look forward to seeing everyone uh, at Rosh Hashanah. If you need anything, you know where to get me. Mark, any final thoughts? Hag Sameach. I hope uh, everyone has a great new year. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>